Hello and welcome to this episode of On the Neutral Ground. Thanks for tuning in. Check us out on all social media platforms at On the NG Show. Subscribe to us on YouTube and Apple Podcasts. Welcome to On the Neutral Ground. I'm Jason Wagensback, uh, host of this show, as well as executive here at the Ranch Film Studios. And I'm excited to have Victoria Green as my new co-host. I am absolutely thrilled to be here. We have a great show today. And uh, without further ado, let's get started, Jason. Let's get started. On our left, uh, we have uh, Steve Estev. Steve is a writer-director, also professor at uh, Loyola University. And on our right, we have Mary <laughs> Mary Kornhauser, uh, also writer-director and professor as well at uh, LSU. And um, we're here today to talk about writing. We're here to talk about directing. What we'd really like to start with is just the basic question. If I am a, um, if I'm, I have an idea and I want to become a writer, I want to see this on the screen someday. Maybe I actually want to further my career and become a writer director. What's the best way for that person, if we were to give them some direction, where to start? You know, I have this idea. I want to begin. What is the first thing that you all would give as professionals in the industry, advice-wise, to this person? Um, anybody want to start? start I'll with you? go really, really basic. Learn format. <laughs> so there's a free program called Celtics, which actually is a whole suite that you can pay for. Is that C-E-L-T-I-C? Celtics or K? K C. C is a Charlie, E is an Echo, L is in Larva, <laughs> X is an X-ray, and uh, you get a free trial, and then you have to scroll all the way down, and it's still free. And um, it will gives you a formatted, the, the proper script formats for all the elements. Then I would take like basic screenwriting books, like Sidfield Workbook, uh, The Writer's Journey, uh, there's a ton of them. I'm not going to waste your time. Afterwards, Steve and I could do a list, and you can put it up. Sure, on your I appreciate website. that. Yeah. And and start to learn about storytelling. Start watching things, but the, uh, read a lot of scripts. Almost everything's accessible uh, because format is key. Form uh, it becomes a, a a part of how you tell your story. I'll kick it over to you. Uh, I totally agree. Formatting is huge. Um, it's one of the things that gets your script knocked back if it's messed up, mm -hmm. if you send it to Hollywood or to any you know, working producers. But I, I agree 100% with what she said. I, I think you should read all the books. There is no one book that is perfect, and there's no one book that's wrong. I think they're all right. I think the best advice to a new writer is to read a lot of screenplays. And there are numerous sites where you can download screenplays and read them, and, and you're going to learn more from that, I think, than any of the books. But at the same time, you just have to start. You, know, you just have to lay, you know, open your computer or your notebook or whatever and start writing the story. Just what, do it. What's one of those, those uh, uh, websites, by the way, just so that we have that? On uh, the air? John August, uh, indie, indie Film, Indie S Writer. I think Script Lab. Um, there, there's tons of them. If you just put screenplays into Google, you'll have a list of unlimited scripts to read. Or ty type the title of the script that you want. Mm -hmm. And then Indie Film or a bunch of them around Academy Time or Emmy Time, they'll usually download have a link for download of the current uh, award scripts. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. yeah. So it's really about utilizing all of your resources. Yeah. So besides reading, and I totally agree with both of you, you read as much as you can, watch as much as, uh, there's so many great episodics out there, uh, watch. What are some of the other resources? Well, obviously, you can go to college and study <laughs> screenwriting. You can. There's numerous, like I teach a screenwriting class. A lot of people do. There's a lot of great programs you can go online and, you know, master's programs and this and that and McKee and all the other ones you can go to. You probably know some of them. Well, you know, being a UCLA Bruin alum, go Bruins. <laughs> I'll say UCLA Extension Online has has that, and UNO has online courses for their department. The LSU does too, I think. Oh, all online courses? Some of my students have taken extension courses from LSU yeah, at some point or another. I'm sorry, you don't know this LSU. I don't know about those courses. <laughs> <laughs> but we're here to learn about one, all one, of the resources today. One thing I wanted to go back, roll back is once you like look at these uh, and get an idea of what the structure is, you have to decide what kind of format you want, okay? I mean, in terms of, you know, are you doing a web series? Are you doing a three-minute story? Yeah. Are you doing it, you know, and what you're, what you're making the story for? Is it for an iPhone? You know, is it for a media platform? Mm -hmm. Is it for an independent feature? Is it a, a no-budget? Are you doing, do you want to do 
um, narrative television series? Is it going to be a 10-minute series? Is it, you know, you have to kind of decide what suits your story. And then rolling back to the script writing format, which is also applicable for television, that's the same across the board. So that's like an essential tool of telling your story, but you also have to decide what format best suits your story. Well, to that point, let me uh, break in here real quick. Um, do you all make the recommendation that people should start with a short story? Uh, because, you know, us as producers and the advice we've given in, in uh, one of the previous shows uh, from Mark Duplassus, who went and spoke at South by Southwest, his idea was go do something for absolutely nothing. Take your iPhone out, figure out a way to shoot a very, very short film, three to five minutes, put that in a festival, see what sort of feedback you get, and then build your way from there. Is that the same sort of respect yeah, in the exactly. writing world that you should really well, kind of start with? I start, yes, I start my students on three to five page scripts. Uh, they know not. They know nothing. Jon Snow, <laughs> Game true. of Thrones finale, um, this Sunday, uh, and uh, and then they may know nothing about technology because it's a writing course. But they have the option at a beginning level to shoot s something. Some of them are more sophisticated and they'll have equipment, and some of them are on an iPhone. But yes, I think that's the best way to familiarize yourself with format and telling a story, but also with technology. Because even if you're just going to stick as a writer, not be a writer director, you have to have some sense of what the technology is, so you can relate it to other people. Yeah, strangely, I find the kids. I basically, when I when I'm teaching kid, uh, teenagers or college age kids, I'm I just say I want you to go write a story, two to three pages on love or hate, and just go learn the software, and they just and they absolutely learn it in a minute. Now, when, I, when I'm teaching to people who are in their 40s and 50s, they have a hell of a time with the software. It's like a slow, slow roll for them. Uh, you, have you had that experience? Well, my, speaking for myself, I'm a complete idiot learning <laughs> programs. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, but with the kids, I mean, the kids are so sophisticated now that it, it is easy. And some of them even code, which I highly recommend actually learning to code. Uh, for young, the young, young people coming up and the older people who are able to do that because that just opens up another kind of storytelling, mm -hmm. you know, through apps and games and stuff like that. Uh, and that is a form of writing. At LSU where uh, I teach, uh, I get a lot of kids from computer science because there's a, a digital DMAE, which is the art department in computer science. And uh, the beginning screenwriting course is... F uh, f uh, an elective for them and uh, I, th I think that because they all code it's very interesting because they do multi oh I'm sorry they do multi-tree uh, storytelling uh, like Jason Bush mm -hmm. and, and and I think that that's an important way uh, for writers to be fluid with the technology and the storytelling because it's not just going to stay linear and I'm including things like Memento and Pulp Fiction and being linear yep. you know because uh, and even though it's uh, whatever 3D it's not really 3D I mean we don't we're so close to VR and different types of storytelling I think that we even us dinosaurs at 40 and 50 and <laughs> 60 or whatever it, we still have to stay fluid mm -hmm. Steve and I attended one of your workshops at a film festival, mm -hmm. and one of the things you discussed was um, creating backstories for every single character. Know that character in your story, inside and out. And a lot of actors do that, but you suggested that the screenwriters do the same thing. How does that bring um, your screenplay to a better place? Well, I think it's the most important thing. Um, not necessarily backstory specifically, but creating emotional DNA for each person in your show. So I, I look at, we watch films and we watch television because of people. You know, you have a great action stories and we've all, we all love those and they come and go, but the ones that stick where you have great stories about human beings, or even if they're aliens, but we're treating them like human beings. So to me, it, the more I know about a character the better a writer I'm going to be. I may not even use the things that I've created in their backstory in the script, but I want to know the why, I want to know what, what makes them tick and why. So when I'm talking about, okay, you were, uh, you know, bullied as a child, you know, and that's a big thing in your life, you know, um, 
I, that doesn't mean anything to me. That's, that's just intellectual. I want to know what happened. I want to know who bullied you, what did they do, how did it make you feel. I want, I want you to know every second of that interaction and how it hits. So uh, the, the bully's walking up to you, you're scared, you feel that fear, and he comes up and he hits you in the nose, whatever it is. But, I, but the more specific you are with the details of a character, what made them tick, the more likely they're going to pop. Now, that doesn't mean every one of those details are going to show up in your film or your, or your television series, but you as a writer need to know them because that's going to inform how they walk, how they talk, how they react, how they act. Everything they do is going to be informed, just like you. I mean, for me, I am 61 years old and I have had joy and I've had failure and I've had fear and I've had I've been punched and I've made love and I've had my heart broken and I've won awards and I've just everything bad good and it all is what created me up to this moment and it's all sitting right here it's right here all the time so every single thing I say and do and feel is going through the filter of all that experience so the more you understand the human beings in your story on that level the, e the easier they are to write you don't have to sit around like, how do, how, what are they going to say? You've already built that in. It's built in into the emotional DNA of each person that, you, that you're putting in the show. And it just comes through. Yes. And I think that's, to me, my take on screenwriting or any kind of writing is it starts with human beings and what makes them tick. Two things that I think you just said that people, I need to reiterate, that people need to take home, which is one, emotional DNA, and two, the why. The why. I mean, Number the why, one. even what I do, I'm, I'm, I love business, all right? I'm, I'm a serial entrepreneur and have created many businesses and I, I'm addicted to it. But it always comes back to why. Why are we doing it? It's not always the product, but why we're actually experiencing well, it. Mari will even tell you, when you're in a meeting, say, with an executive at a studio or someplace mm -hmm. out in L.A., and they are digging your story and they're talking to you, and they're going to say, why did they do blah, blah, blah? Mm -hmm. And if you don't have the answer right then, they feel like you're not ready. You're not, you're not, you didn't do your homework yet. Have you had that experience? Yeah, but I'm a character writer, so I, I usually know the answers. But yes. I think a really, and I agree with you 3,000% because I teach through character, and I believe that all action comes from character. Case in point, and don't ask me why, but I love the John Wick movies. <laughs> okay? And I'm giving a plug to John Wick 3 coming out. But why do I love these movies? Why? Because of how they set up the character. Ex you know, and I'm not, it's no spoiler, his wife died of a terrible disease and she'd given him a puppy and the young Greyjoy kills the puppy and, <laughs> and, and then boom, he's off and running. And that character is why we can handle 90, you know, 90,000 people getting killed. Mm -hmm. And then he gets a second dog, right? And now we're all rooting for the dog and apparently the dog I'm not spoiling anything because it's all over you know the dog doesn't die in John Wick 3 so you can comfortably go see it and and, and I think that's all goes to character I mean it might be very thin character but it, it creates that uh, emotional connection well, well I've got another example for you that's maybe more cheesier than than John Wick but if you look at the story Die Hard Okay, Die Hard is a, this classic action film when we think of Bruce Willis and all the fighting and all the shooting and all that kind of thing. But that's, this, that's not the story. The story is about a guy who's a cop who's split from his wife, and he's showing up on Christmas Eve with flowers and something and whatever he's got to take one more shot at saving his marriage because he loves her and he thinks she loves him. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, in this story, he's going to have to attack the building and go through a, a horde of terrorists to get there. But the reason we remember Die Hard is not the action. It's because, the reason we care about Die Hard is that we care about his why. We care about his why. And now that, that, and you look at the ensuing Die Hards, it didn't have those. They got worse and worse as they went because it got more about action, more about action, and more yeah, about action. Franchises. Yeah. Okay, going off of that, I'm going to give you, you, you guys out there, uh, is a formula, uh, which Please. is unique and over universal. So that means each story has to be unique. Using the Bruce Willis example, it's a unique, uh, well, I don't know what, the, I guess at the time it was unique because of the uh, storytelling mm -hmm. aspect. Uh, um, but the, so there has to be a unique spin to the story. 
uh, I, I can only think like Moonlight. Mm -hmm. Okay. Another Bruce Willis, but yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. No Moonlight. Oh, the, the, the movie, movie Sorry, Barry Jenkins, Moonlight, the which would seem yeah. was really really successful. This is a better example. It was a universal story in terms of family and wanting to belong, mm -hmm. and it was unique because of how it was told, and and uh, unique for many people who didn't who weren't gay black. They've never experienced growing that up before, in, right. in mm -hmm. the projects of Florida. So each story, if you can find the unique element to tell your story and the universal way to kick it in, that brings you audience and it also a way for you to connect to your own story. Because moving back to the why, you, you have to, inside yourself, like acting, you have to find a way into the story that's from your heart, uh, from your soul, and not just from the intellect. We... <laughs> we must be teaching the same shit. <laughs> I, I swear to God. Because I always tell people, like all my students, and I have like, you know, college age students, and I have like people of all ages, and I probably coach 100 writers off and on in different ways, right? But I always tell them the same thing. This is not where your story comes from. This is where your story comes from. This is where you edit and do all the other things to polish it up and make it work. But this is your magic. It's everything, don't listen to this. Because this is the same thing that tells you not to be a writer, not to be an artist, not to start a business, not to be an entrepreneur, not to fall in love, not, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's, this is the no, this is what tells you not to do stuff. Well, even coming from my world as being a producer, and an entrepreneur. In, an entrepreneur. I go in, which is, by the way, one and the same, if yeah. you think about that. Sure. Um, uh, when I stand in front of uh, executives and I pitch stories, you know, the first thing they say is, you know, give me a story where I have the feels. What am I going to feel when I hear this pitch? And what am I going to feel when I'm going to now go out and produce this movie with you? Oh. And so that is the immediate selling point for how you can get this well, moving along. So let me just add on to that. If you're, if you're trying to sell screenplays in Hollywood or even local producer, you, what we all want, all of us who read constantly and what we, I can, I can probably speak for Mari and maybe you guys as well. The last thing on earth I want to do is read screenplays but it's my job, so I read screenplays constantly. And what I want to have happen when I read that is I want to feel something. I want, if I, I'm reading, because I'm a cynical reader, because not because I want to be, because I've read so many things, right? I'm sure you can agree. But if somebody, if I'm reading something and I cry, I'm like, whoa! I laugh out loud, I, I'm, I'm afraid when I'm reading it. I mean, that makes me really excited. Really, I don't care if it's a first time writer who's 18 years old or if it's a 70 year old man or woman who's come up with some crazy idea. And when, I, when I'm reading something and I, I absolutely feel something, oh shit, I get excited because it's not that common, really. So, going, I, I just wanted to go back to the this and the this. And the words I use are the subjective and the objective. Mm. So, the only difference between a writer who's new and experienced writers like, oh, I keep touching the microphone, oh, my apologies to tech. Uh, um, uh, the differences be, uh, between um, beginning writers and writers like you and me, Steve, or Steven, uh, are way. the fact that you and I know how to write subjectively, meaning from our heart, and objectively at the same time without having to stop. True. So we, we in, our, in the back of our head, go, okay, well, this is going to be cut. Oh, I We're cleaning up it up here. as we go. Right, yeah. but we don't actually do it. We do it later after we finish yeah. the writing. Because the biggest mistake for writers, uh, beginning writers, is to understand that you're going to be writing really badly and vomit, and, and then you stop and you rewrite the same 20 pages over and over and over and over again and never finish the screenplay, or you don't get to structuring it. And the truth of the matter is, bad pages are good because they're the best to get to somewhere else. And, and that is where don't concentrate, yeah, concentrate on getting the feeling out first whilst beginning to train muscle memory to the objective. Did that make sense? That yeah. did. And to that point, I was thinking of exercises. Are there exercises that you recommend writers to, to take? Because, I mean, initially... I mean, I want to see a synopsis before I read a screenplay anyway. Is that a great way to begin uh, a possible story that you're trying to tell? Is well, we tell it to me in three pages versus before you go out and write the 80? Or when you want to write an episodic, give me the synopsis and then figure out the Bible? What is your recommendation Well, I'm sure we have stories? different... different uh, Which is great. I would love to hear the well, different paths. I, I can tell you this. I, it, I don't always do it the same way. I'll, I'll be honest with you. Sometimes I... I, I've been, usually I, whatever I'm writing, I've been thinking about for quite a while. 
So, so, and I, but what I will do sometimes, most of the time, I will write a treatment, like a three, four, five, six page story. It's almost like a test drive of my story where I sort of lay out the basic structure of it and what the basic problems are and what the needs and wants are the, of the main characters are. That's one way of doing it. But sometimes I get, like, I have to write that opening sequence. I have to write it. And I make my, I just can't stop myself. I have to write that first 10 pages or first eight pages. Um, sometimes I'll write an outline version of that. Um, but I have to always kind of know the ending. For me, for me, I have to know the end. If I know the end, I know I'm going to write every single page I'm going to do is about setting up that ending. So, I'm Howard. different. I'm yep. a structure dominatrix. I, uh, I usually start off writing in a journal. Well, let me, let me clarify. I'm moving into dystopian science fiction. By the fiction. way, Structure Dominatrix, that should be your next book. <laughs> that, that's, or my, yeah, or my next something. Yeah. Or it could uh, just be TBD. your, was say, be my your nickname. Yeah, be your my, t-shirt. No, honestly, I swear, I look at you and I think, that is, that is it. That is it. <laughs> Thank you. So Structure uh, Dominatrix. I'm sorry. sorry I'm going my on. mind was going right. places that I don't know if I want to say with my sense of humor. And I did come up during the hashtag Me Too movement, so I could have gone a number of different ways with that comment. I'll go for it. <laughs> well, I don't, you only have 45 minutes. That's a different uh, topic of conversation. We could go Different sure. podcast. Yeah. It is a different podcast. You know, women in... Uh, and certain uh, and men going through the process mostly in 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 Hollywood and Los Angeles and what was had to be done anyway uh, my process for independent film um, I mean in a character driven film because I tend to write small intimate pieces so I would write kind of sometimes first person and write in a journal then I I and then that would give me kind of the framework for the story and, and character. And then I go to scene cards immediately, and I card out about 60. And when I get to 60, I know that I'm kind of ready to go. And I go with a, I call it a grid, where there's a fence post. And, and it's basically 12 points on the fence post, which is normal. A 363 is often what I have my students write, a sentence for each of, uh, if it's a main protagonist, of three points in the first act six points in the second and three points in the third act just to get a basic idea of the overall of the story. Sometimes I'll do that, but the scene cards are key for me because I'm a horrible pitcher, so I'll tend to have the thing written and then try to get a producer such as yourself <laughs> and go pitch the story. Now, I, as I mentioned, I'm moving into dystop to 2065, and so I'm having to deal with astrophysics and world building and, and all sorts of stuff. Uh, television is different, um, but it still ha is based on scene cards, but often, and it depends if you're creating it, then you have to, to the process is the same because there's a structure, not just for the pilot, but for the overall arc of the season that you're breaking down for your Bible, which works similarly, oddly, to uh, a three-act structure of a screenplay, because if you look at the episodes, particularly in a 10 episode or a 16 episode arc, you can easily fit them into a three act. Uh, the 22 and the 24s are a little bit harder. Anyway, so, but if you're writing on assignment for uh, a writer's room for TV, oftentimes you have to do the beat sheet, which will consist of the scene heading and then the summary. And you'll have put out, I mean, everybody's seen the whiteboards with uh, all yeah. the scene cards for the TV shows. So you have to, to, and they're not always filled in. So depending how the room works, you know, you have to fill them in and then get approval before you go right. So I'm structured that way. I need to know not everything, but almost everything. And then when I get my scene cards, I like cards because you can tack on uh, dialogue, you, you know, you're on the bathroom, or you're at a bar, and you get an idea, and it's on a piece of tissue paper, you know, whatever. You can clip all that together. Yeah. But then you, then I would rip that out and then put it to the applicable scene card. Mm -hmm. For those of you who didn't know, he pulled out a notebook. Um, and anyway, so that's, great, that, that's, that's yeah. what I do. But going back, I'm, is it okay if I circle Please, back? Please, go back. Yeah. Uh, is if you're starting off as a writer here, because the, the, the thing that you also have to realize, people out there, writers and directors, is, but particularly writers, is, uh, we are the only people who do not retain control of the copyright. 
it is sold. It is intellectual property. And as soon as you sell the copyright, you basically have no leverage whatsoever. And it's gone forever. So uh, you, it's, if, if you want to control your copyright, then this isn't the medium for you. Because uh, even if you make a film, the, the, you, you have to assign over your copyright. And even as a director, uh, most deals, some of it's changing, like in music, but most of the deals, you assign it over to your distributor, the copyright. And that oftentimes was fraught with peril in the independent world. Um, so how do you start out? You get an idea. You can do some of this research on your own. I think New Orleans is uniquely positioned uh, to, because there are a lot of people, and it is a very creative city, to form your own group if you decide to go that route and not have like a mentor or a teacher with you. Some of you can form that yourself and, and stick to it. Uh, like there are organizations like WIFT, Louisiana. This is for women because women need a little extra push. Women in film, women correct? Women in film and yes. television. Yes, film and television, WIFT, yeah. That occasionally does uh, writing things. Mm -hmm. Sometimes Novak, they have, and mm -hmm. certainly probably would be open to doing that. And the Louisiana Screenwriters Boot Camp. There you go, thank you. Can you actually tell us a little bit about that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I when I first got here, um, I'm from I'm from LA, and I came out here. I, I married a girl from Louisiana, so when that happens, you know, it. you're here. You're here. You know, they they don't. No one from Louisiana wants to leave. But I, I got here, and I had been on a bit of a roll out there. I sold three things in a row to studios, and I thought I'm huge. But the process of development was a backbreaker for me. I always saw myself as a filmmaker, not a screenwriter specifically. Um, I wrote to make, and out there I got lucky and sold some things, but. I felt broken from that. I felt like I might as well have just been a stockbroker or something, you know. Some of the soul was being sucked from my body. And so I came out here and just started and just decided to make a film, come out here and make a film. Um, I started this, I thought, how am I going to make a living out here? So I, I just branded myself. I'm louisianascreenwriter.com if you want to check that out. But I, so, and I just became, I just started a film, a screenwriting comp course, you know, called the Louisiana Screenwriters Boot Camp, and we've been doing that for like 15 years, and it's been fun. You know, one, the last film I made was actually written by one of those, one of those writers, and uh, that was really a fun thing to happen. We've had people go off and get films made all over the place, and that's a very exciting thing for me. I feel like because I've when you, as you well know, you meet people, you you see them from zero to 60, and you see this whole process, and mm -hmm. you know, like they say, making the sausage. Um, yeah. It's difficult, and some people don't understand what's required. They think they wrote a first draft and they're done. And I think, no, 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 not even close. This is not what we're doing. You are a hundred more to go. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the biggest sale I ever got, we, I, me and another person wrote 22 drafts of a comedy and I gave it to my agent in LA on Thursday. He read it on Friday. He decided he went out with it. And on Monday he sold it. Right. That's, but that's 20, and that, by the way, writing 22 drafts guarantees nothing, you know, but that particular one, that's how it went. Now, I think it's really because he went golfing with the guy he sold it to on, <laughs> Sunday, on the Sunday between. So he think, he think, I think he already knew who he was, who he was selling it mm -hmm. to. But also, but, but can I just interject? Yeah. Because the key to writing is rewriting. Oh, yeah. And that's a whole different process. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when you put pencils down and you give the draft to your friends, oh, it's great. It's not great. Mm -hmm. I'm just telling you all that right now. And you're going to have to get feedback and then do another draft. And then the way rewrite process works is you do multiple drafts. And by the way, feedback other than from your mom, you know, because... Who yes. loves everything you who do. Who loves everything well, you hopefully, do. Well, yes. hopefully our, 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 our friends who are listening will, and are interested in this, will have found a network of, of peers who are good readers and that's the most important thing. You don't give it to all six people at once. You give it to one reader at a time and then take notes and adjust. And I think the other thing that I, I, I believe is happening all around the country, but also because my friends are doing it and I've done it, which is you collaborate with people who have equipment and shoot these three or four mm -hmm. minute things and you all learn. You also learn in terms of television, if you're doing a web series, how to kind of hold a writer's room and 
cross board and get your production done mm -hmm. and all of that. So you're kind of being a one man band. So I can't emphasize that. And you're also bonding. You find out who you can work with for this part of the process, meaning writing, and what will be for the technical aspect of the process. And you skill swap. You know, I've, I'm unfortunately weak on a lot of technical skills. So I, I, I set up writer's rooms. You know, I'll come in and set up a writer's room. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, exact I'll be the showrunner and rewrite all the stuff that comes in. Which is massively important, by the way, because again, I'm, I'm not a writer. I, I need folks like you all to come up with great ideas. I like to say I'm BASF. I don't make it. I just try to make it better, <laughs> yeah. you know? And so that's really what I like to come and interject is, is good ideas on the soul of a, of a great story. Uh, and you brought up something, networking. Networking is massively important, and I think we've talked about it on every single show. All writers, producers, directors out there constantly try and network, get to some of these conferences, get in some of these groups, find people online locally, meet with people on a regular basis, and do kind of what we're doing here today. Have coffee with somebody, talk about their ideas, collaborate, because you're going to need other people to help you move along, whether it's being critiquing your your screenplay or your uh, your your um, well, your screenplay that you're writing that you're trying to put out or whether it's you're going to try and go out and produce something you have to have a team behind you and you have to have good people that are going to be willing to give you you know collective proper criticism just as you said not just like family members saying that was fantastic it's going to win the next Oscar you know so it really is <laughs> yeah, important if that was true I would have won a lot of Oscars already <laughs> collaboration is so important the film festivals take advantage of the film festivals even UNO Film Festival 48 hour mm -hmm. um, the Louisiana Film Prize every time I go to a film festival Festival, I, I check out the talent, mm -hmm. not just in front of the camera, but behind the camera. Um, I do have one question mm -hmm. uh, before we kind of change gears a little bit. When I write, I only write about my own personal experiences. Fortunately, being a little bit mature, I have a whole wealth of ideas <laughs> and I'm developing them. So my question to each of you, do you write from your personal experiences? And if not, where do you get your inspiration? I definitely write from my personal experiences, and many of the things I've sold have been based on stuff that I've done. Although usually, my, in my personal experiences, I have to fire me from the story <laughs> and put somebody cooler or more interesting or more fucked up. Oh, Sorry, that's all right. Uh, I'm all I'm always uh, better looking uh, and younger. And uh, but I, you know, I have to I have to do that eventually. I'll start off with it as me, but I'll realize that I'm the weakest character, and then I'll have to put somebody better in for th for that part. But I. Almost everything comes from that. Although, on the other hand, I get a, I've done a lot of adaptations of other people's uh, books and things like that, where it's other people's stories. I've had a sort of a quite a run of those. It's very very interesting finding finding your connection to that material, you know, and still trying to make it your own at the same time. Very, it's very challenging, but also quite fun. I don't know if you've done that, but it's fun. I separate them. I kind of, the things that are very personal stories are usually written on spec, and I kind of look at them as my novels, even if I'm not directing them, and then find a collaborator who will be able to tell the story as best as possible. Because I had a complicated life full of trauma, so in almost everything I write, whether it's an assignment or not, it's got something in trauma, and that's usually my way in. Uh, on other, yeah, I've done adaptations on on for hires, and or like on a, like on Treme, you, you, there was somebody else's vision of a real event that happened, and you have a TV show that's all in one voice, so you have a lot of boxes to tick as a as a working writer mm -hmm. to hit, while still putting in uh, your own voice and your own experiences. But what was funny on that is anecdotally is because I came from film, I was much, I was very visual. So I put in more visuals than most of the other writers in the room, which I was told later, you know, and which I don't know if it's true because who knows how reliable the narrator was. So that goes back to do format because once you've mastered the format, you then develop a voice. And what's compelling when you were saying you're looking to be moved, Steve, you were talking about that. Part of that is how you can use the format, much like cinematography. It's, it's a format. Um, it's a medium, but it's also a format. 
in the, in the sense that I'm using it, where the, the white and the black and the format on the page becomes that. And you use that as syntax in a way to, to deliver your story. Mm -hmm. Because you're telling everybody, every department, how to look at it while psychologically capturing your reader. Um, moving back, I'm moving into different areas now uh, in terms of what I want to write about. Some of them are very, very small uh, in because I'm moving into theater and I want it to be like cheap to put up. But I'm moving into areas that are in the future. And my backstories, I'm doing a project uh, for television that takes place in 2065. So I'm doing backstories. Instead of doing them how I normally do, I decided to do them as plays. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to separate my copyright, so I didn't want a conflation of characters. The 2065 takes place on the West Coast, so my backstories of the plays take place between 2040 and 2045 in the Gulf Coast. So I wouldn't screw up who owned my characters. Again, that's going back to the copyright. It's a business. Never forget that it's a business. You have to write with your heart, but it's a business. Mm -hmm. so, so I'm doing these very intimate one-act backstory plays mm -hmm. that are picturing, taking snapshots of world building as I'm going up to 2065. But I have to research all this stuff, you know, from like, you know, astrophysics, quantum mechanics, I don't understand this stuff. You know, water management, you know, mm -hmm. all this kind of stuff. So you're in this big world and you're building this story, but when I get down to the characters, then I'm gonna find, you know, my way in into the characters. But it's a bigger canvas than I've ever worked on, on my own. I worked on bigger canvases with other people, you know, who created things or the show, but I've never done, you know, like a 10 person, you know, lead or characters to follow. I've always had like, you know, one desperate character fighting against all odds, <laughs> getting defeat now. Uh, Asylum know. was wonderful too. It was very moving. Pardon? At Asylum. Oh, Seeking uh, Asylum. Play. Yeah, thank you. I was very moved and thrilled to be at that first screening. I mean, first presentation mm -hmm. um, yeah. of the play. It was, it was, it, it was very moving. It was uh, immersive and enlightening. It's basically about uh, climate change, diaspora, and immigration. And I'd started with one scripted thing, and then we decided to make it, uh, to torture the audience and make it immersive. So I workshopped it uh, uh, at Art Club, who also produced it with Reese Johnson Collective, uh, with Lisa Shattuck and Shamika Gray as the actors. So it was very, close-knit group of people collaborating and now I'm rewriting it based on because it was one scene and it now is four scenes based on the workshop that we did there so working in theater or, and working with people on that level you can do the same thing with the screenplay if you have the people involved with if it's short this is rolling back to what Jason mm -hmm. was saying no nope, you're good Kurt here um, Rolling back to what I was saying, sorry. It's so about doing short, uh, doing short pieces. The yes. advantage of doing mm -hmm. that is you can have this full collaborative experience. Mm -hmm. I think which which because the most important thing for a writer and also a, a fledgling director, for a writer you learn more when you see your work put up. You see how you f up. You see that you're writing. You don't need this dialogue because the visuals are doing the dialogue. Mm -hmm. And less is more. Let me and give you a perfect example of that. My first, the first script I wrote that got made, right, that I actually directed to, was called Favorite Son. It's the reason why I first came to Louisiana way back in 96, and where I met my wife as well. So the whole thing all stems from that project. But I wrote this script, and every, I, I was, everybody was telling me how great it was and all that. It was a 124-page script, indie film, with about a $500,000 budget. And when we made our first sort of cut, I'll say bet more than a rough cut, a fairly fine cut. It was two hours and 47 minutes long. Oh. That was a lesson in overwriting. Because really, we just shot everything I wrote, you know? Over budgeting. <laughs> yeah, under, under budgeting, over scheduling, everything's, everything's either under or over in a bad way. But that was a big learning experience. And I think I learned more from the failure of that process in terms of writing, because screenwriting, and I know she'll agree with this, is that it's, it's the art of telling a story in the fewest words possible. I mean, it is really the fewest words possible. And speaking about the structure being a factor, it's like there are hardcore guardrails 
on a screenplay, whether it's for television or for film. And you have got to be in those guardrails unless you're, you know, Christopher Nolan or Tarantino, but there's only two of them. So, so you have to, especially if you're just starting, you don't want to be the person who's writing a 300 page feature. It's not gonna happen. So, but those guardrails at first seem like they're really holding you back. And then once you master them, as she was referring to, once you have those figured out totally, it, it becomes like freedom, you know? So I, you can use one word to describe something and it can be evocative as hell. Whereas if you're writing with a novel with no guardrails, you're off in every, down every rabbit hole, which as writers, we all love. That's why we like television so much because we get to go down the rabbit holes to some degree. Mm -hmm. But in your writing a feature, man, you are stuck in this 100 pages now of give or take. And you have got to be inside of them. So now you're, you're sort of cut loose a thousand ways to take advantage of that guardrail, of those limitations. The limitations become your freedom. I don't, and it's weird to explain, but I, I just find it easy. You know, I don't, I'm not saying easy to write something great or sell, but I'm starting to at this place in my life as a writer where I have no problem with that. You know, it is like fun to me to see how much I can cram into these guardrails and still be pacey and fun and crazy or whatever we're doing. Um, there's something about the guardrails, the limitations that set you free. Yeah, I think that's true in all art. You need to know the rules in order to break them. That's right. But uh, just a tip for you budding screenwriters out there. You can... Knowing the format and knowing the structure, can I rattle off a teaching thing right now? Please, by all means. Okay. You'll hear the word beat a lot in terms of actor's beat, mm -hmm. and I'm referring to a character beat, mm -hmm. a writer's beat. So the smallest unit of action in a screenplay is a beat. So a series of beats equal a scene. A series of scenes equal a sequence. And a series of sequences equal a first act and a series of acts equal a feature. Usually the first act is three sequences. And then there's usually 12 anchoring sequences within a film which the trailers are made up of those set piece stuff. So you'll find that you can't, you know, mathematically not everything is the same page. So there's something called tempo, which is controlled by the activity within a scene, how long the scene is, how short the scene is, you know, would matched against uh, se uh, sequences. So if you think of it like music, you can control the hundred pages to seem really long at one point because it might be a whole note and say it's four, 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 four times, so that's four beats in terms of music, or it can be 30 second notes, you know, so you can control that tempo. You'll understand when you start writing. <laughs> but the point is, is that you have a lot of tools in the toolbox in which to work with. And um, this may have just overwhelmed you, but those units of action are part of creating the tempo mm -hmm. and the narrative within that. Similar again to cinematography and to sound. Um, I was going to give a plug for sound. Can I say a plug for production if they haven't had this on out of your podcast? Go right ahead. You can deal with buzzed cinematography, but if the sound goes out one frame, you're out of the movie. So Absolutely. always take room tone. <laughs> always take room tone. That <laughs> yeah. is so true. One of the things uh, I've, I've had the uh, fortune of speaking with UNO students, mostly the documentary mm -hmm. film students, and um, I'll tell them I've been on sets, and people will say, Oh, well, the sound isn't great. We'll fix it in post. <laughs> like, stop. Mm -hmm. And it, with documentary filmmaking, if you're interviewing someone, stop. You want them to sound good. It ha there's no subpar. There's no mediocrity. Every frame has to count, and the sound uh, is so important. I totally agree. Yeah, Everything should be done perfectly. Cut and do it again. If your color isn't perfect, if your visual isn't perfect, if that word on your page just doesn't jive, redo it. So I'm in total agreement. Yeah, sounds extremely important. I, I want to um, 
ask you a quick question about hate crime. You talked about it a few moments ago because one of your students wrote it and you directed it. Tell me about those dynamics and also the actors that you were able to get to portray these individuals in the film. Let's see. Well, the, the writer was in my class and he had come with... Um, he had written several other things prior, and I'd sort of were working with him on those, but he came in with this thing that I had, it was unlike anything he'd written before, and he, he, all he had was the first act, but I was sold on the first act, and I thought, okay, I just, and it was weird because it's a slow movie, and it's a very, very demanding film, and the script was demanding. It demands you to hold your breath for a long time before you find out what's happening. And it's unlike every other, I mean, films these days, you just, you, you pretty much know the film from the first five minutes. And they're designed that way, you know. But this one made me constantly want to know more, want to know more without being angry at the film. Um, sometimes I'm watching a film and I want to know more and I'm pissed off at it. I'm like, come on, give it up. You know, I'm like, but this one didn't make me feel that way. I felt bad for the people that were stuck in this situation and I cared about and I wanted to know what's happening. And it was like that from the very beginning. So we worked it, we workshopped his script in the class over a, over a year or so, two years, and then we spent about eight years, Jason will know, because he was an early reader, of trying to get this thing together. We went to the, we went the Hollywood route for a while. We, had, we went with like a $5 million budget and then had some stuff happening and that cratered. And then we went to a $2 million budget, had some stuff happening. Even I even gave up directing it so somebody else could make it happen. And then that cratered. And then it just got to 1 million and the 750 and then the 500. Then it went all the way down to 100. And we were just going to shoot that sucker and just do it. And then as we started, just made the decision we're making this movie no matter what, even with this iPhone and a flashlight. Um, and then suddenly some money started coming back toward us. So, um, and we ended up getting a really interesting cast. We had um, Robert Redford's daughter. Amy Redford, who, who hasn't, we haven't seen her in a lot of things as an actress, but she was fantastic, fantastic. Uh, got a fellow named Kevin uh, uh, Bernhardt, who is a uh, really very successful screenwriter. And, but he had been a heartthrob in the 80s. He had done like General Hospital, he played Frisco in General Hospital, and with this, he was on Dynasty, and, and he just hated it. He thought, oh my God, I'm going to be one of those people that everybody hates, you know, like, because he's so good looking, and he just quit. He said, I don't want to be this guy. So he just started writing, and he has had a great career, but somehow he just slid into our hands, and he was fantastic. And we had John Schneider, who lives up in uh, Holden now, who did a great job, probably the best thing he's ever done. So we had a great little cast, including my daughter, who you met, um, and we had a really good time making that. But it was really, it was the dynamics were difficult, because we had so little money. Um, the writer just stepped back. He didn't even, once we took over, we just sort of did it. So we weren't, he didn't, he just let it happen because he, he didn't, he was new. So we just went with it. I polished it up a few times with him and, and um, I don't know if that answers your question, but it was just an incredible experience because we had like a three week shoot and the shoot itself was fantastic. And the, the thing with the actors was uh, really powerful. And I knew we had something while we were shooting it. We, went, we took it out into the world. We were in film festivals all over the place. We, we tried to get into the big ones. We didn't get in, so we realized we were not going to be a first-tier festival film. So we just went this really intense second-tier and third-tier strategy where we were in tons of film festivals, and we won a ton of awards, best picture. It's an LGBT sort of Q slanted film. So we, had, we went to a lot of those and did really well. And um, although we were the straightest film at every gay festival we were at, there's no question, <laughs> but it was, we did well there and, and it took a little while, but we got distribution, so it's, it's exciting. And it's, it's your, oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to say, like, through what you just expressed, like, you're right, I did have an opportunity to read that script very early on, and it was one that made, you know, the, the hair stand up on my arms. It was such a beautifully written story and a piece, and I know it took a while to get, you know, to where it was ready as a shootable script. Uh, but to that point as well, just know that this process and this business that we're all in 
is constantly a struggle from what you just said. We're constantly trying to find a way to get the story up on the screen. And even after that, we're trying to find a way to get it to the audience. So it's constantly and, and, finding and avenues. Also, this is a terrible time for independent films. You know, it's not like 20 years ago where they would write you a check for your film. Mm -hmm. You know, basically, it, unless, you're not, unless you're one of those top tier festival winning films, there's not a lot of money coming towards you. Mm -hmm. So it's a much different experience than when I started this years ago. Um, you, you are finding yourself in situations where you're actually giving your film to someone and there's like an 80-20 split or something or a 70-30 split and, mm -hmm. and you're not getting upfront money for a lot of the films and, yep. and a lot of good films. So it's a different different market than it was And once. more the reason to the point that we were all talking about here, finding the emotional DNA, the why, and really putting a lot of effort into what you're writing and not just, you know, writing to a, hopefully throw something out there that, you know, we all think that there is a market for. Write something that emotionally you're invested in. That's why every um, film is a cause. Yep. And worry about, worry about the, uh, the money, the financials, the industry, the business later. If you're going right to make a heart. film, though, you need to have your own personal why. Yeah. Why you're, why you're going to go to the mat, why are you going to take it all the way. Mm -hmm. As a director, because you're basically the only person who cares. That's exactly yeah. right. <laughs> Everybody else will drop out. And, you, and, they will, and you'll, they'll drop out, and someone else will come in, and then they'll drop out, and someone else will come in. And then at the end of the day, you may, start with, you may have started with a bunch of friends that you love and adore, and at the end, you're working with people you never met before. But it doesn't really matter, because you're taking it. I, I remember once I was interviewed for something, and some, I was going to make this film called Kissed on the Lips. And, and, some, and somebody said, uh, I, they said, how do you know this film is going to get made? You know? And I said, because I will never ever quit. That's how I know. And I'm still working on that film right now. I, the, the, what you all should be thinking about is Sisyphus pushing the rock up the hill. Yes. Yes. Because that's what it's like. Everybody's all excited because you have Annette Benning attached and then Annette Benning drops out and no one cares anymore that you're working with because the, the money's dropped away. Mm -hmm. And the only person that's going to make it happen is the director. Boom. Boom. Yeah. And that's Sisyphus. You were carrying that, you were yeah. pushing that rock. Absolutely. Exactly. And I've done it so many times. I mean, in fact, whenever I'm the most down and out in my life, I always mm -hmm. think, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And at that moment, I say, oh, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to make a film. I'm going to make and this film. The one thing I have, you know, uh, writers out there, uh, if you write a script, you probably have to have a sizzle reel now if you're going beyond, even probably here in Louisiana if you're looking for money. People want to know, right, it's not the old days where you could just kind of submit a script. They kind of want to know what it's going to be like visually before anybody sinks any money into it. And since there's very little money to be had, you want to separate yourself from the pack. The other kind of warning I want to give is your first script, you got to write a lot of scripts. So, you know, just stick the first one in a drawer and just keep writing and then go back to the first one and pump it up in terms of format. Because you're not going to learn everything on the first script. Nobody does, you know? I, you, know I, you know, I still make mistakes, you know? And, and so the, the, just keep writing and writing and writing and writing and writing. And it doesn't have to be good because it will get better on the rewrite. So learn the format and, and merge it. With, uh, uh, form is content, and content is form with screenwriting. I want to add one thing to that also. Is I, I've become a firm believer in, and, and I'm, I've become a sort of a disciple, without him knowing it, of this guy named uh, Stephen. Um, what's the guy who wrote The War of Art? Um, you know that book, The War of Art? I'm blanking. Anyway, it's, it's, he, he, says that, he says that you should write a script, and I really believe this, as fast as you freaking can. Stephen Pressfield. Pressfield, yeah, Stephen Pressfield. You should write a script as fast as you can. You know, do, the, do your prep, do all the planning. If you do cards, whatever you do, do your prep. But when you sit down to write it, you should write it as fast as you can write it. You shouldn't spend, when someone tells me they've been working on a script for a year, it makes me nervous, you know? I mean, and I'm not saying work as in, I'm talking about writing the part, the writing part. I think you should write it as fast as you can. There's going to be drafts and there's going to be other things, but get that, as she called a vomit, vomit draft. Write it as fast as you can. Get it over with and then start the, the work of making it fantastic. But I think the, the people that spend years on a screenplay, years and years and years, 
um, it's just not a way to write a I screenplay. I guarantee you that the majority of them are reading them as they go. So I agree with you, and the only way to do that, don't look new back. writers, is don't read it. Don't look back. Yeah. I, we mean, it, if you're going to fail, fail forward. Yeah. No, know? I mean, so you don't read your writing. At the end of the no. day, there's two tips. One is don't read it. But stop at the end of the day when you know what your next scene is going to be for the next day. So there's this thinking of excitement that yes. we're going to go back and sit down at the computer. Mm -hmm. And then write, 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 write. You know, set a page count, you know, whether it's 10 pages a day, 20 pages a day, whatever. And make that, no matter how bad it is. But again, stop at a point where you know you're going to, uh, you know, stop at a good or bad point. But the most important thing is you know what you're going to write the next day when you sit down. So the cursor just isn't blink, 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 blink. Mm -hmm. And just don't read it till you go to the end, you know, the end. Then you can read and edit, and a 100-page script becomes 40 pages. <laughs> but you know where you're going, you know? And it's like, ah, oh, I did it, I did it. And look how much I learned, you know? And that's, uh, that's process. And, and it takes away so many barriers, because you want to make the process of the first draft, as, uh, not even for, excuse me, of the vomit draft as low barrier as possible. I think also when you're, when you're writing that first draft, you're a better writer at the end of that draft than you were at the beginning. And by a better writer, I mean your skill set didn't change, but the, the script teaches you how to write it. Mm -hmm. So when you, you start, when by the time you get at the end, something has happened in the process, I'm sure, for most people. You're a better writer at the end of that. So, so you have to rewrite anyway, you know, no matter what. And... The script then tells you what it's really about. Yes. Because what you thought it was about when you start writing isn't it, and that's why you now have 35 or 40 pages, and you have to like go back and kill your babies. Sorry, you you have to learn to do that, and then tell see what the story is telling you, recard, re-outline, whatever, and then that's what your heart has been telling you, but you didn't get it necessarily yeah, you're, here at the first time. Your unconscious, your heart, what your whatever you want to call that, it is it hopefully takes over. And I mean, the greatest feeling you can have as a writer, for me, besides winning an award, and someone handed me a big old fat check or something, but the greatest feeling I have is when I'm writing and the characters start doing shit that I didn't think of. And, I, and, and I'm like, yeah, you're in the they're, river. They're using my hands. They're using my hands, but they're not using me. I'm just, I'm just, they're, they're the stenographer or something, you know, while they're running wild in my script and ruining the plan I had in every possible way. <laughs> yeah, and that's you're like, the best. Oh my God, I but never it, thought of that. And that's happening, you know, it's fantastic. It's feeling. magic. Yeah. I have learned so much today. I have a, at least four scripts that, <laughs> uh, that I've started that are in various stages. And I have taken away myself personally so many great ideas, mm -hmm. and I think our audience and all of those aspiring writers and those that, whether they've been in it for a while and have several scripts and what do I do now, will take away so much information, so many great tips. As a final thought, is there anything you would like to add um, as far as briefly explaining your personal experience, just wrapping it up, any advice, final thoughts? Well. I will say this. Uh, I've been doing this a long time. I've been a writer f f uh, at least 30 years. And I will say this. The film business, I'll speak to film and television, is the love business. You, and it's not, you don't expect people to love you. You have to love it. You know, if you have, if you don't love it, don't do it. I, re I just really, I mean, if you have a plan B, take it. If you have a plan B, you'll take it anyway because you'll, because it's so hard. Mm -hmm. So, and, I, and I'm, I'm not recommending to young people to not go to college or whatever they, but, you know, if you, this is about, you, you have to love this because it is not going to be friendly. It is, you will have to love the shit out of it from beginning to, to, till you, the day you die or quit. Personally, I'm not quitting, so it'll be till the day I die. But you have to love it. It's too hard to not love. Don't do it for money. Don't do it for fame, do it for love. If you do it for love, something great's going to happen. If you do it for the other two, money or fame, not going to happen. Fall in love with the process, yeah. not the reward. Love it. Absolutely agree. Mary, okay. any final, final thoughts? Well, one, don't spend your own money. Uh, <laughs> two, two. Very, one. very good point. <laughs> <laughs> two is we're, we're talking about kind of two different markets. We kind of went back and forth between for starting off writers and staying local and building an indigenous community here. 
I, I think the most important thing is to make things and, and uh, find your peer group. If you want to go work for a television show or whatever, I would suggest trying to get on a writer PA or a writer's assistant mm -hmm. on one of the shows that are shooting here and, and learn from them while, while developing your skill set because they'll want to be reading some writing samples. Because basically those shows, you know, most of them, the writer's room are run remotely, so those jobs are usually in L.A. or New York, and then a producer will come out here and produce it. So we're talking about basically two different trajectories. Uh, a great film for writers once you get a little bit more experience or if you want to learn and you have some money is the Austin Film Festival because that is a writer, writer, writer-friendly thing. Uh, you know, work at the New Orleans Film Fest, you know, to, to get access. There's a lot you can do here on your own. We do need to create our, our own intellectual property. That will be your business card, your calling card. And you can do business out of here, but you need to know kind of who you are, what you want to say, and what your marketplace is in terms of what, if your story works well on an iPhone versus a, a television series, that will make your life a lot easier. And I wish you all the best because we need all the new voices and people to tell their own stories who haven't been able to tell their own stories. And we need you to come to the table. Yeah, one more thing on that. If you want to learn how to be a director, make a film. That's the best way. Just That's make a, a film. Point. Just make it. Yeah, that's a great point. So a couple things that I've taken away today that we'll leave everybody with are, uh, from what it sounds like, understand format so that we kind of know our barriers that we're coming from. Bring with you the emotional DNA and the why. When writing, don't stop the vomit of writing or just the constant of just getting it out onto the page. And then at the end of the day, we need to network and we need to obviously love the process that you're going through. Because if you want to be a writer, we all know there's there's some pain and heartache that's going to be involved. Throw it on the page and love what you're doing. Um, Steve, uh, I believe we can find some of your information online. You're at Louisiana Screenplay Louisiana Workshop? LouisianaScreenwriter.com. LouisianaScreenwriter.com. And Mary, is there anything we should expect from you coming out soon? I, I don't like to talk about my work. I love that. Because it's going to be wonderful when we get a chance to see it. It's going to be really probably dark and disturbing because that's <laughs> usually what I do. But I just wanted to hone in again, just on format. Sorry to harp no, on sure, this. No, sure, go ahead. C c format's more than just format. It's an orchestra, mm -hmm. which is why I was you know, camera is a camera, but it's what you do with it you know, that makes a cinematography. And first you need to learn the format, then you need to learn how to shoot with it. I guess it's the easiest way of putting it. And so um, it's not just format it's magic that's yes. all i wanted the to magic clarify. the magic of storytelling i think we end it with magic <laughs> thank you all so much for coming in today uh absolutely wonderful podcast we do absolutely appreciate you all being here well you do a really good podcast so thank you well thank you it's a pleasure to be here absolutely yes it is thank you guys have a great weekend <laughs>